Are we live? Yes, we are online. All right, good. Thank you so much. A very good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to the first uh, webinar of the Seismic Academy for the year 2024. Uh, it, it has been a long journey since the inception in 2022, but uh, but I will take the first five minutes to also get you familiar with the initiative, what Seismic Academy does, what what is the intent, and then I hand it over to the speakers for a very wonderful and exciting session over the next one hour. So before we begin, uh, it's uh, what is Seismic Academy? Some of you might know, some of you, for some of you, it would be a new topic. So it's a forum which we which was created for academicians, professionals, authorities, and industry experts, wherein we come together, disseminate knowledge on the topic of earthquake engineering. The whole intent is to create awareness and develop expertise on the topic. In the current scenario, it's a very, very prominent topic and uh, creates a lot of, uh, requires a lot of awareness to be created. And that is why this initiative, it's an initiative by Hilti and it was launched in India in 2019. It had its presence in Italy in 20, uh, since 2013, but in India we started and then we were struck by COVID. However, the intent of this, uh, of this particular academy was to make this as there is a, uh, so the vision was to make this as one source of information for all initiatives in the country related to earthquake, wherein we engage with uh, with the engineering fraternity through uh, knowledge sharing platforms like webinars, uh, physical co seminars, conferences, uh, collaborative events. We bring out publications, articles. Uh, we also, uh, with the help of uh, the academics, we also engage in certain R&D projects. And then at the end of the day, we create a central repository uh, for for all such information there are a lot of data available but they are all scattered so we want to also create a kind of a central repository we have a lot of we have a very strong advisory board who keeps on guiding us in this regard and uh, helps us create or craft a right direction as to how it can be leveraged and better uh, made better accessible to everyone and uh, Every, every year we come together and create a very detailed plan through which we can create a sustainable impact, which includes identifying gaps and challenges and also how we can uh, contribute to the uh, need of the country and give our inputs in terms of code development, research initiatives, courses, trainings, capacity building workshops. We have taken strides over the last two, two and a half years, uh, wherein we started uh, through multiple webinars. Through physical workshops, we have magazines or journals, trimester journals, uh, several publications, research projects, and a yearly conference, which we generally do in a physical mode. We have had uh, the uh, privilege to host some of the experts in the field, in the field of earthquake engineering, not only from India but also from outside. Uh, they took, uh, they they came to this platform and also shared their views and know-how with all of us. We have uh, engaged in collaborative events with National Institute of Disaster Management, Delhi Disaster Management Authority, wherein we have engaged for the capacity building for multiple uh, government officials, as well as private officials uh, from across the country and not just Delhi. We also collaborated with DISB, MTPC in this regard. So we keep on engaging in such workshops. Uh, and we all know that when we target capacity building, it also has to be done at a very uh, at the very basic level. So we also reached out to students and different institutes wherein we engage with certain active, uh, we engage with the students in doing these collaborative programs for their enhancement. And uh, we have a trimester journal which we publish, uh, which focuses on various case studies, uh, experiences, uh, uh, the new trends and technologies on in this regard. And uh, this comes out once in four months. We also uh, collaborated with Professor Weising of IIT Roorkee, wherein we tried to develop a small module. It's a 15 minutes module to understand the evolution of earthquake resistant design and the subsequent parts are work in progress. So we released this last year, middle end of last year, and then the subsequent parts are all coming. We engaged with IIT Roorkee to create a, uh, to undertake a research project to understand the seismic safety of non-structural elements and uh, we took to the shake table testing as well as the pseudodynamic analysis to understand how the non-structural elements actually behave. 
Overall, this has been uh, an enabler. We have tried to make it an enabler to create awareness on the topic, the websites, the journals, the workshops, the conferences, and uh, and a lot of activities in this regard. And uh, the conferences have always been blessed by the presence of uh, the stalwarts from the industry, a very active participation from students, from uh, faculty, from practicing engineers. Everyone has joined us, and we have successfully done two conferences over the last two years. So this is a very exciting journey for all of us. So what we are planning to do specifically in Q1 is this is the webinar which we are targeting. We also have a three-day workshop planned in March in collaboration with NIDM. Our next trimester journal is in, uh, in again in the month of March. And then we are also targeting online modules in the subsequent parts. So that's the initiative. And uh, we can always only request all of you to come together because you are all experts in the field. You are working in the field can bring a lot of insights and inputs. You can contribute through different case studies, through different articles, share your knowledge, be the advocate to create this awareness on earthquake as a topic. And with this, I come to the topic of the day which is earthquake resistant uh, steel building designs. And before I go, I hand it over to the speakers, our illustrious speakers. Uh, maybe we, we take this as a, as a uh, poll and I request Kaushal to launch the first poll, which is just to understand if, uh, if you're all familiar with the proposed revision of IS 1893. So there has been uh, this standard has been in wide circulation for quite some time. It be the Bureau of Indian Standards together with all the professional bodies. They created a lot of awareness about the provisions of the standard, took a lot of insight. And uh, the intent is if all of you are aware of this. And uh, while I see that uh, there was a lot of, uh, of activities which was conducted, we were also fortunate enough to collaborate with IS Trakti. And uh, through our journal, we covered the proceedings. Maybe uh, Kaushal can share uh, the link of the journal. Uh, if, if any of you is interested to go through it, you can please uh, refer to that journal. It, it's a pretty comprehensive coverage of the two sessions which were conducted. And it was conducted and in, uh, in the month of last uh, May, June. Now, when we talk about the revisions of 1893, do you also feel, and the, the second poll goes like, do you also feel that it is important to do the earthquake resistant detailing of steel structures? And or rather, do we actually do it? So Kaushal, if you can launch the second poll and uh, So we can still see a lot of people voting in the first. So around 72% of the people said that they are familiar with the revision of IS 1893, which is excellent. And then uh, currently, are so are you familiar? So Kaushal, maybe we launch the third poll of the day that are you familiar that there is also a standard which has been developed and published with respect to the earthquake resistant design of steel structures. If you feel that is that is important, do you, do you also know that there is a standard which is already in existence? And it is, it's a, I see it's, it's a 50 50 ratio. So a lot of people are already aware that the code exists, but then there are also a uh, scope for improvement wherein we can really create this. So uh, and with this, I, I will also share in the chat box, uh, Kaushal, if you can just put the put the link of the uh, BIS website in the chat box from where people can actually freely download the standard. And uh, this actually takes us to the topic, the first topic of the day, wherein I hand it over to Professor Rupin Goswami. And uh, and uh, before I hand it over to uh, Goswami sir, maybe a brief introduction. I mean, most of us already know him. He he has been one of the very active members and a stalwart in the earthquake engineering uh, sector. So he's currently the uh, professor of uh, Department of Civil Engineering in IIT, IIT Chennai. 
and uh, he has a lot of accolades but then that would take a lot of time and that's why i simply hand it over to rupen goswami sir and it's a, always a pleasure to listen to him so over to you sir uh very good morning afternoon evening to all of you wherever you are and uh, thank you uh, mr mitra it's uh, you know it once again a privilege to be back on this platform and uh, i'll try and do justice to the task that you have given me in terms of uh, talking uh, or introducing this new standard uh, in a very brief way i believe uh, the screen is visible the screen is visible perfectly visible sir wonderful thank you so much uh, good evening uh, ladies and gentlemen i'll try to be very brief maybe about uh, 30 minutes or so and uh, just introduce this new standard but at the same time also uh, you know talk very briefly about the salient most important uh, aspect of earthquake resistant design and detail that we do today right so as we all know steel structures in india are uh, basically the design and detailing is governed by is 800 and we have had this section 12 which deals with the design and detailing for earthquake loads but very recently uh, bureau of indian standards has published this in last year itself uh, IS 18168, and I'm going to focus and briefly introduce this particular standard. Too. Now, when you talk about uh, earthquake resistant design, the first thing is uh, understand that uh, earthquake is a very different type of loading on structures, and it's actually not a force load but displacement load. So, in general, when you talk about uh, analyzing structures for different load actions, these are the ten basic load force loads that we consider. and then talking of displacement loads there are six and the last one as you have can see i have highlighted uh, separately because that is very special and we are going to look at some of the important aspects of it so basically what when earthquake soccer uh, there is no load at per se that is uh, applied on a structure rather the force is induced in a structure because of the motion or shaking that happens at the base of the structure so basically during earthquake different levels of displacements are imposed on the structure and forces are induced in them so just to quickly recap uh, if we can design a structure uh, such that for different levels of shaking uh, bigger earthquakes will impose larger displacements smaller earthquakes would impose smaller displacements and if we design the structure to remain elastic uh, the maximum force that would be induced in the structure obviously we can all see would be this and nothing would happen to the structure as such of even after that very big rare event is over uh, the structure would come back to its original uh, config you know uh, situation and uh, it will continue to serve the purpose however it is also possible to design the same structure such that uh, under smaller earthquakes it would not get damaged but under moderate and uh, and large earthquakes it would get damaged and in such a case the maximum force that would be induced in the structure obviously we can see is going to be much lesser so therefore given this choice we as engineers actually deliberately design our structures to get damaged because then in that case the maximum force that would be induced in the structure would be much lesser uh, than if it were to remain elastic so this brings us this unique aspect of earthquake resistant design that we say that we will allow damage to our structures under moderate earthquakes but only condition that we put forward is that if that very large infrequent rare earthquake ever occurs during the design life of the structure the structure must not collapse and that is what bring makes earthquake resistant design very very special very different from design for any other load that we have seen and this is where we do not re, i mean or, or, or rather we rely more on deformation capacity and ductility capacity of the structure than the strength of the structure so what do i mean by that essentially this is because of this particular aspect uh, that earthquake is a displacement loading we want our structures to have ductility capacity ductility capacity is nothing but the ability of a structure to deform in a you know deform without any further enhancement or reduction in strength basically as a as a plastic material the structure deforms 
and the ratio of ultimate to yield displacement is generally what we consider as the an estimate of ductility capacity of the structure. We definitely do not want brittle structures. So using this, let us understand the relation. So I'm say, I say I made the statement that more than strength, it is the deformation capacity and the ductility capacity that matters. Why do I say that? Let me just explain that. So if I have to design a structure, the first structure I could have designed like that, in which case the ductility requirement would be this much, basically this plateau length that you see. But then that structure should have had a capacity, a strength capacity of this much. But instead of that, if I want the strength capacity to be lesser, I can still design the second structure but in that case the ductility requirement to increase and i can keep on doing this until and unless i hit a limit of how much maximum ductility capacity i can provide that becomes the minimum strength that i must provide to the structure and this is where we basically the relationship between strength and ductility so essentially, if we can provide more ductility, we can design the structure to have lesser strength and vice versa. But when we talk about strength, uh, we generally, when we do design calculations, we deal with design strength, with partial safety factors and so on and so forth. So if we remove the partial safety factors, then we come to what is called a nominal strength or characteristic strength. But even that is not the real strength of a structure. The real or the actual strength of a structure is much higher because of various reasons like safety factors, load factors, or sometimes we just provide a section which is more than what is required, right? So therefore, we talk about a term called overstrength and not just design strength. And this is going to be very important. So therefore, let us look at this. If we design a, the structure for a force which is only this much, we know the first damage will happen at a higher force than that and the actual structural strength will be even higher. But this strength, all the, even this strength, is definitely going to be lesser than this because we are going to you provide ductility capacity to the structure. So therefore, there are two aspects in this. One is called the overstrength, and the other is the ductility. By providing adequate ductility and acknowledging that there is going to be an overstrength because of the way we do our design, we even take advantage of that and actually use a force, elastic force reduction factor or what we commonly call as response reduction factor. And that is precisely what is prescribed by design standards like IS-1893. And so we use this. So we calculate the elastic force and then reduce it and actually design the structure for a force lesser than what it should have been designed for if it were to remain elastic, right? So deliberately, we are accepting the, a damage in our design, through our design. But then worldwide, and that is generally the strategy used by all international standards, not just for steel structures, for all, you know, for reinforced concrete structures, buildings, bridges, and so on and so forth, mostly. But when you talk about steel structures, we see a uh, not so desired behavior in the, uh, in the past. We have seen that. For instance, here is a beam column connection, a welded connection, you can see the fracture, you can see tearing of, you know, and failure of connections in bridge pairs, you can see fracture of 100 mm thick base plates in steel, buckling of columns, buckling of braces, tearing off of column sections in a building, failure of fracture of braces, buildings getting extensively damaged or even collapse. And so is the case with bridges, and we have seen this again and again, right? So, and even, you know, one uh, once in a while, we see steel towers failing. So the whole idea is that du during earthquake shaking, steel structures need not always be earthquake resistant, and they are not, definitely not, until and unless they are designed and detailed to be one. The major challenge that we see, we have seen in the past, is that of poor ductility capacity of steel structures. Now, this sounds very ironic because steel as a material, we all know, is very ductile. But steel structures need not, by default, 
be ductile and therefore earthquake resistant until and unless we design them and detail them appropriately. That is the the, the main point that uh, you know we wish to drive uh, through this particular paper. So therefore, the natural question comes: Okay, therefore, how do we design or how do we build ductile structures? The simple answer is we need to avoid all brittle modes of failure that are possible, be it in any type of structure. Today we are going to focus on steel buildings, but it can be any structure. Any brittle mode of failure needs to be avoided uh, through design. And that is what we are going to see. So in steel structures, if we see what are the brittle modes possible and what are the ductile modes of failure that are possible. All you know, axial, shearing, buckling, uh, connection failure, these are all brittle modes of failure. There are only two possibilities of so-called ductile mode of damage in possible in steel structures. One is bending or flexural response in plastic sections. Suitable sections means plastic sections. We'll quickly see this. And then possible uh, possibility of allowing controlled shear yielding in steel plates. Where, do we, where can we allow damage? not everywhere definitely not in soil foundation joints or columns because most importantly if columns fail buildings collapse right so therefore the only location where we allow damage is also very important to identify a priori and usually that is that happen that is allowed at the beam ends or in special devices like shear links that we are going to also you know very briefly look at so how do we do this when you talk about damage Remember, strength capacity comes into the picture. So if we have to allow damage in certain locations and of a particular type and not allow damage in certain other locations, we need to set a hierarchy of strength. That is the basic concept in design. In, and this particular concept is called commonly known as capacity-based design concept. Let's see what it is. Uh, the most common analogy or example that is used to explain uh, capacity design is the following which is called the chain analogy so let us say that we have a chain here made up of all these interconnected links and we have two types of link elements one the orange one and let's say another is the blue one and we have two possibilities in one case we allow the orange links to be stronger but brittle in nature and use only one ductile link the blue link which is whose strength capacity is less than those of uh, that you know that of the brittle links that is one possibility the other is to use that one ductile link blue link which is stronger than the rest of the uh, blue uh, rest of the brittle links which option do we choose if we want the chain to be ductile chain representing as an example of a structure. If I want the structure to be ductile, then I need to make that ductile link weak because the weakest link controls the behavior of the chain. And this is a very important concept to remember. So wherever we want damage, we want damage to be of ductile nature. And that element or component or member in the structure where we are going to provide ductility needs to be relatively weaker than the rest of the elements that are there. So therefore, a very important concept that comes again, once again, is how do we design the brittle ones not to have any damage or failure? We need to design them to have strength greater than that of the ductile link. And therefore, here the question comes, which strength of the ductile link? The answer is it is the actual or the overstrength capacity of the ductile link that needs to be first estimated and use that as the design parameter for design of the brittle links. And this is precisely what we do in capacity design. So once again, overstrength comes into the picture. It is not the design strength that matters here. Let us look at some examples to understand this. So there are certain steps in doing uh, a capacity design. I'll take a simple example of a moment frame. And uh, the first step, of course, is use Indian standards, estimate the loads, use load combinations, uh, use load factors, and do a structural analysis. Let's say we have done the structural analysis and we have got a bending moment diagram. 
So next step is to say that we want damage to happen at the beam ends. So the beams should form these plastic hinges and have damage in them. So if that is the case, then we come and first design the beams. How do we design? Follow IS 800 procedure. Use partial safety factors, use characteristic material strength, uh, you know, depending on uh, which cross sections or, you know, you are using, choose a section that is plastic. And that essentially uh, gives us the design of the beam. Now, once the beam is designed, now comes the actual, uh, the, the important question, okay, that design was, let's say, for a certain design strength. But what is the actual strength or what is the over strength of the beam capacity of the beam that we have designed? So this is where uh, we look at two different, two important factors, parameters that come into the picture. One is that the actual material property that we have used in the design calculation need not be the need not be correct in the sense that the actual strength provided can, can be more. Also, in design calculation, we have used partial safety factor of gamma M0 and kept the stress level less than Fy. But when we calculate this particular ZPB and, you know, but then in reality, there can be strain hardening of the material and even higher stress levels can be generated. Typically, how much more? It is somewhere uh, if all other things are done correctly, including connection design, then about 10 to 15 percent to something like 20 percent over and above FY, that level of stress is possible. And essentially what happens in, in beams with double, you know, I sections, the flanges actually go into strain hardening and that gives the additional strength. But more importantly, the strength that we use in our design calculation is the nominal or characteristic value, which means in most of the cases that 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 value is going to be exceeded for instance if we are looking for steel with 250 mpa yield strength in most probably cases the actual yield strength will be more than 250 and there is nothing uh, much to be happy about it we'll see why so how much more in general it would be so a statistical you know analysis is done of uh, by of various types of samples across the market and across the country and if you look into IS 18168, it talks about a material uncertainty, material strength uncertainty factor, essentially this factor RY. So what it says is that if you go and uh, procure steel of yield strength 250 to 75 MPA, it is likely that the ex expected strength would be 40% more. You can see this factor 1.4. If you go and procure steel of 300, you know, yield strength of square minimum specified yield strength of 300, it is the expected strength is going to be 30 percent more and so on. So now the question is, why are we talking about it in this case? Because we are trying to estimate the overstrength capacity of the beam, actually how much more. So if the these are more plastic moment capacity of the beam was only MPD, what we see is that because of this uncertainty factor in the yield strength and the possibility of the, even if we consider 10 percent enhancement in strength because of strain hardening this basically tells us that the actual or the overstrength capacities can be as large as 50 percent to 60 percent more than the estimated nominal plastic moment capacity very good so beam has more capacity we should be happy about it but then there is a catch that it's not that just that the moment capacity increases for that moment to be mobilized during a very big event there has to be an associated there will be an associated shear force that will also get generated and this shear force this vpr that you are seeing the most probable shear that will get generated is going to be much larger than the shear that you shear force that you have got from your linear elastic structural analysis under the reduced force level. And so now if we do not design, for instance, the connection between the beam and column, for this enhanced moment and shear demands, then obviously the connections are likely to get damaged. If we design the connections properly, then this enhanced shear and moment is going to get transferred to the column. And then if we do not design the columns for that, the columns are going to get 
and so on so forth. So it's a chain reaction. It's along the load path we have to see. But essentially now what has happened is that we have moved away from the results of our structural analysis and now the actual force that gets that is likely to get generated within the structure is now governed by our choice of beam section that we have provided and the materials that we have provided right so that is how capacity des design affects the entire process of structural design and ensures uh, structural safety by providing a hierarchy in strength and this process needs to be applied between any two adjacent components or members along the load path so as structural engineers we understand what is load path and along that load path we need to do this so if we do all this essentially what we are doing is we are trying to ensure that only ductile mode of damage happens but that's not just enough because at the end we want a structure to be ductile for that individual members you know, where we want damage, they need to be ductile. For that, the section should be ductile. And that is why we are insisting on using only plastic section. Fortunately, in steel structures, the material by itself is ductile, right? So steel, very ductile material, but that is not enough. Along with ductility, we also need two more additional properties to be guaranteed. One is uh, toughness which is essentially the amount of energy that the material can absorb before finally failing or fracturing. And this is where we generally use the CVN value uh, for that. And if you go to IS2062, you will see different grades of materials. So for instance, E250 means 250 MPa in strength, but then there is uh, A, B, BR, B0 and C. These are the four categories of steel for the same grade. And what is permitted for seismic application is only B0 and C. Essentially, it requires this particular uh, amount of uh, CVN test value at 0 degree centigrade and so on and so forth. Also, the material uncertainty factors are there. It also is related to the weldability of the steel. And so, uh, uh, along with the material specification, we, there are requirements for the weld and so on and so forth. As far as section is concerned, only the plastic sections are to be used, not even compact semi, and definitely not semi-compact and slender because they cannot sustain a plastic hinge. Otherwise, what will happen is the ductility capacity will be limited by local buckling and so on and so forth. So you will find in IS18168 a separate table like this, which is you know very similar to the one that is already existing in IS800. But if you do the calculations, there are two aspects you will realize. The material uncertainty factor is an addition in these tables and the numbers that you will find here will be little on the conservative side than what you will find in IS 800. Because IS 800 is for general construction in steel, whereas uh, 18168 is only for seismic application. So obviously we need ductility and therefore uh, these numbers are going to be a little strengthened. Very important is once the section is chosen, the members have to be laterally resistant. Otherwise, the plastic hinge formation will never happen. And so you will find extensive uh, requirements uh, given of bracing, uh, their stiffness, their strength, and most important of all, the connection design requirement for the bracing elements. And then, of course, P delta is another aspect that, it, that we need to take care of in design of steel structures. So with this background, I'll very quickly take you through the more, you know, the, the important clauses in IS18168. Now, the whole idea of development of this is that uh, there was a need failed to create a document by Bureau of Indian Standards, which can be seen as a parallel document of IS13920. We all know general construction in, in concrete plane and reinforced concrete is governed by IS456. But when, you, when we talk about earthquake resistant design and detail of reinforced concrete you know, buildings, we refer to IS13920. Similarly, a parallel document IS18168 is for steel buildings. Although general construction will still continue to be governed by provisions of IS800, but 
18168 will give additional requirements for design of steel buildings so therefore the table of contents are arranged in a very similar fashion except so we begin with scope reference terminology and general provisions and then you will have provisions for beams columns beam column joints column base structural brace and shearing and finally there is a section on special requirements for structural systems and we are, we are going to see that we will have three structural systems uh, that is uh, introduced in this particular standard one of course is special moment frame which is which we are all very familiar with uh, special concentrically braced frame and then eccentrically braced frame important point here is that uh, the provisions of the standard or the so called earthquake resistant design and detail uh, need not be done or need not be used for design of all the members in a structure right uh, for earthquake resistant designated frames can be identified and designed suitably for that also it is possible to develop design guidelines for dual systems just like what we have in reinforced concrete structures for steel buildings also wherein designated frames alone would be designed for uh, to resist the earthquake effects of course uh, in steel structures there will be special situations uh, where uh, you know uh, generally if the inter if, if these lateral load resisting frames intersect then those columns will have to be checked for some special situations where frames coming from both directions can have inelasticity in them so the additional load uh, conditions will have to be uh, checked for but fundamentally uh, there are few key terminologies the key items that are introduced in this the concept of protected zone uh, the concept of capacity protected elements essentially following design capacity design principle material uncertainty factor we have already discussed and uh, demand critical welds because uh, between welded connections and bolted connections welded connections are always uh, generally preferred for seismic application once again these uh, particular grades of steel are permitted minimum there is a minimum requirement of uh, you know cvn value uh, which is which becomes important in design the use of material uncertainty factor will be found extensively in the standard uh, these are the values that you will find in and and these are basically the clause numbers the relevant clause numbers uh, that you see that you see on the screen right there are requirements for wales and when critical wales. section classification as i said so as i said these numbers will be little on the conservative side for instance for mild steel 250 of 250 mpa yield strength uh, if you go to ice 800 roll sections you will find the uh, d by t limit of 9.4 whereas here you will find the limit coming to around 7 and 7.4 7 and a half so it means that uh, for seismic application and particularly when we expect that ductility to have you know uh, to be present in the ductility capacity to be present in the system we need more stringent requirements of d by t d by t and so on and so forth but again these are only for the LLRS, basically lateral load resisting systems for earthquake and special frames. Now, in steel design code, even this exists also in the current IS 800, you will find this special load combination, wherein it talks about this factor, overstrength factor, omega. We have discussed this, that if we design a structure here, its actual capacity is always going to be higher. The question is typically how much higher? There is no fixed value that can be assigned but generally these are numbers two and a half to three are numbers that are well accepted and used in uh, design uh, as an international practice and so that is also you know introduced here but the only important point to remember is these are load combinations to be used only for special elements for instance columns right why because Although the IS1893 gives us the estimate of this force level, the actual force that would be induced in the structure is likely to be this much higher. And under that condition, you do not want your columns to buckle or columns to fail, right? Because that would lead to collapse of the structure and that is not uh, you know, desirable. So therefore, only those elements and connections and so on and so forth. 
uh, there are stability bracing requirements and uh, there are certain minimum stiffness requirements as per IS 18931, uh, IS 800, these things will continue to work. For the time being, only use of double symmetric uh, parallel flange rolled or built up sections is used and conforming to the B by T, D by D requirements. Uh, if the slenderness becomes more, then obviously lateral bracing has to be you know, provided and the design of the bracing, the stiffness, strength and connection design, everything is given, including design of splices of these beams. Similarly, for columns, uh, only W symmetric parallel front sections for the time being and box sections are permitted. And there is a limitation on slenderness because the simple fact is buckling is a brittle mode of failure and therefore, these columns, which are part of lateral load resting elements, are uh, should be designed not to be governed by buckling. That is the only requirement that we have. Similarly, design for bracing and column splices and everything is there. Coming to this very important aspect, beam column joint design uh, is uh, is explicitly you know talked about, stated provisions are given here, and this is a very important thing. And in beam, in the design of beam column joint, there are three main components. One is the column to beam strength ratio because if we want damage in the beam and not in the column. So columns have to be stronger than the beam. How much stronger is the question? Second, the force flow from the beam to the column happens through this common portion called the panel zone. So the panel zone has to be designed suitably so that we do not have undue damage in this. And then, of course, the connection has to be designed. We have seen the example that the connections will be subjected to much higher force level because of the uncertainty in the material in strength and strain hardening in the uh, beams. And therefore, the connection design becomes important. Do you want damage maybe, at the beam? Yes. Sir, maybe I just uh, step in a little bit. Uh, uh, maybe another five minutes, sir? That yes, yes, yes. We are, we are almost done. Perfect. So, so we want to have damage in the beams and columns have to be stronger for that than the beams. The question is how much stronger? Uh, if you look at all the possible, you know, uh, roll sections that are there and design different heights of buildings and so on and so forth, you will get different uh, estimates of how much stronger the column should be. It all depends on how we define the capacity of the column and how we calculate the demand coming from the beam. So, for instance, what you see on the right hand side are all essentially same statement written differently and accordingly this number keeps changing, right? So, finally, what you will find in the standard is this de definition of column to beam strength ratio. My request is not to focus on this number alone, but also look at the definition how the capacity and the demands are calculated and accordingly you will find. Similarly, Panel zone can be designed to get damaged or not even get not get damaged. This is called a weak panel zone. This is strong panel zone. This is a balanced panel zone. Uh, we have given a design which will give somewhere like a balanced panel zone. And similarly, reinforced connection design is given. There are very important detailing requirements to be done uh, for in, in, in terms of weld access hole. So those things are also there. Column bases, uh, we need uh, explicitly requirements are given and one important thing that is given is that columns can be designed to be pin, you know, as pin conditions uh, in buildings and there is nothing wrong. Similarly, provisions for structural brace and brace connections are given and shear critical links, the design capacity for links are also provided, right? And how the stiffness have to be provided and so on and so forth. Finally, coming to the structural system, you will find very, you know, the structural system for each of these given under these four heads. And the most important thing I want to highlight now is this basis of design. So what it says is, for instance, for spatial moment frame, it says that after following this standard, what kind of design a designer is going to provide, uh, you know, produce. That particular structure, in that particular structure, what is likely is flexural yielding of beams, limited yielding of panel zone, little or no yielding of columns. So as a designer, I know exactly what kind of structure I have designed. And that is how the you know, system goes. And then the requirements, special requirements are given. 
for instance in concentrically braced rim buckling of brace in compression is expected and yielding of brace brace in tension is likely to happen during a strong earthquake shaking and that is how the energy is going to be dissipated also special cases of analysis where the compression uh, brace which is buckled needs to be removed from the analysis or a residual strength only needs to be accounted for those kind of things are given and then usual other general provisions are given similarly in eccentric equilibrium strain the only location where damage is expected is shear link and for that the design is given and so when a designer designs a eccentric equilibrium strain as per this he or she knows exactly how the structure is going to be and behavior is very important because if we do not understand or anticipate the behavior we will make mistakes in design and during earthquakes these mistakes will be you know uh, will be brought out very very in a bad way and so that is the whole thing but very importantly uh, at the beginning when the poll when the poll was going on um, there was a reference to the proposed revision of ice 1893 and in that you will find a very interesting thing coming up in future which is use of allow allowing only a certain type of structural system for certain category of buildings and in certain seismic zones you must be wondering why this seismic zone 6 this was already circulated uh, there is a uh, as part of the proposed revision of ice 1893 there is a new hazard map uh, new seismic hazard analysis is done but maybe that will be an occasion you know on another occasion we'll discuss this i'll stop here uh first of all of course uh, with all the colleagues in the bis committees who you know developed this document but uh, i'll stop here by thanking seismic academy and mr mitra in particular for this opportunity jai thank you thank you so much i think it was <coughs> such a wonderful learning experience for all of us getting to know the code and getting to know the concepts as clearly as possible so uh, i think it was a, a absolute wonderful learning for us <coughs> sorry and with this i think uh, one of the important topics is while we are uh, extremely focused or we we do a lot of activities in terms of ensuring the uh, safety of the structure at times we also tend to ignore how the structures are connected either to the existing concrete or to new concrete so that's where uh, we have the next speaker mr michael rosley <coughs> he has uh, around 18 years of experience working in the development of codes and testings in europe he is working with hilti corporation for the last 18 years and he has also been part of hilti southeast asia pacific so uh, without uh, further ado i will hand it over to michael to take us through the importance of connection specifically in seismic so we understand seismic detailing of structures now it's also about seismic detailing of the connections and what are the test regimes so over to you michael thank you mr mike just one question do i have a little bit more or do i have the half an hour or because i guess we are a little bit michael uh, would be great if we can have it by around uh, 20 25 minutes and then we can take few questions that would be okay i will try i will try my best yeah, yeah. thank you I'm sharing my screen now. Can you hear me? It, it is visible. It's clearly visible. Excellent. So then, also a warm welcome from my side, and thanks uh, for the introduction, Jonak. Happy to be part for the first time uh, for the Seismic Academy in India. And today, I will give some info on Fastmus and uh, how Fastmus shall be designed in for seismic loadings. I will introduce a little bit the research, the background of this uh, provision that we do have in Europe, and then also show a little bit how to qualify anchors and how to do the proper design. Just for the first slide, no, I did not switch. Yes, just looking. Uh, So the 
seismic events that you are facing in India. Here in Germany, I guess we don't face those much seismic events, almost nothing. But for sure in India, it's completely different. And you are facing almost 250 to 300 uh, events per year with a magnitude of four and above. So seismicity is for sure a big topic that you are dealing with in India. And looking also at the seismic map, uh, seismic map of India, and uh, in the last half an hour, we learned a lot how to design structures for seismic applications, especially steel structures, but I guess it's pretty much the same also for concrete structure. And there we have advanced codes in India, but all over the world, how to deal for the structure for that. If it comes to fasteners, we are using fasteners partly for structural connections, maybe for bracings. I guess I saw also a small chapter, I guess it was chapter nine, if I remember right, in this Indian code. Uh, for the fastening of steel beams and steel elements, and uh, but even maybe more commonly used fasteners to fix secondary structures. Just a couple of examples for structural connections like bracings, usually to strengthen existing st structures, and they are usually steel elements need to be fixed to concrete elements, to foundations, to uh, columns or stuff like that. The next slide is showing now a couple of examples of fastening of critical equipment. These non-structural components, however, are also important, especially in case and after a seismic event. I guess their um, electricity generators, transformers, and stuff like that need to work also after a seismic event. So therefore, I guess that's quite crucial that these are fixed. These equipments are fixed very safe and reliable, also fastenings in hospitals, in schools, shelters, stuff like that. Uh, Michael, uh, there is a, a feedback that it's, uh, maybe you can be a little louder. Okay, I can try to do it. Thanks. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'll try to do it here. Um, the next uh, slide is showing now a couple of examples where fastenings failed during a seismic event. The picture on the left-hand side shows an overturned tank after an earthquake in the U United States. And on the right-hand side, you see a fastener, you see the fastener that failed during the Kobe earthquake for, and this fasteners had the task to fix and fasten uh, air conditioning unit. So, this for sure are not good examples and we would like to avoid those things. And a couple of other examples, I guess these are some examples uh, from Australia and New Zealand. So therefore, 20 years ago, the provisions, especially for fasteners, were not really established how to design fasteners under, under seismic loadings. And uh, since then, intensive research has been done and target was for sure to understand much better the behavior of fasteners during a, seism during a seismic event. And coming from an earthquake, and today we learned a little bit how to design then for a specific earthquake with a certain magnitude and so on, the structure. But for the fastener, we go even one step a little bit deeper because what exactly happens with the base material, what does this mean for cracks, crack cycling during a seismic event and crack bits that is very important for a small and tiny fastener and what are typical load, loads that fasteners um, and, and actions that fasteners see during a seismic event and how to design those fasteners in a proper way. Therefore, can you hear me now better? Sean, I was yes. still... Yes, yes, it, it's better. Thank you. And um, therefore, Hilti started um, together with uh, many other researchers, some um, projects, and this one is now showing, and this slide is showing a full-scale test in, at the University of San Diego where um, this full building was on a shake table and 
to basically be measured in this uh, the behavior of frame nodes and with the target to see especially what crack widths um, will form during such a seismic event and what are the consequences for fastness. And uh, in the next slide, you see now, based on this basic research, there were done additional shake table tests with uh, component test systems with different anchors under different configurations um, with concrete slabs that are cracked and, and with anchor configurations up to four anchors with different masses and with different stiffnesses. And the next slide is now showing just a photo of this uh, testing. And uh, you see basically what's done here on a, on a concrete slab that is in this frame. There's fixed this uh, weight, and this one is everything is on the shape table. And then there's an actuator to load the full system. And the next slide is showing now a short movie what happens after, I guess, 7.5 seconds. Basically, the acceleration starts, and then you can see basically what happens. And in this test, the anchor displacement, the cracks that have been developed, the displacement and also the loading, the anchors have been measured and uh, to understand just the behavior better and to see what exactly are the loadings and the situations that anchor face during their first click. And based on all this research, basically at the University of Stuttgart, there was a test protocol um, developed that first of all considers the correct test protocol. So what correct cycling is uh, realistic or needs to be considered during anchor testing to consider realistic situations during an earthquake. And on the other side is also what anchor nodes need to be considered and what is an anchor node protocol to test anchors and to qualify anchors. And uh, this procedure has been now established since more than 10 years in Europe. And uh, why do we need that? I guess this is pretty easy. Now you see here a bunch of anchors, mechanical anchors and bonded anchors. And it's very hard to say which one is now the right anchor, especially for seismic loading. And what is the performance that you should apply or that you can consider when you design those systems, especially for seismic loading. And therefore in Europe, we do have so-called European assessment documents and in those European assessment documents, basically it's laid down how to test those fasteners for static and also for seismic loading. If they are qualified for seismic, that's optional. So not each and every fastener is qualified for seismic loading. And all those uh, fasteners are tested in basic reference tests and functional tests and can also be tested in those seismic testing. And I will explain a little bit more what that's, does this mean in the next slides. Um, so there's a test protocol for the basic tests. That's basically tests that everyone would expect that we are doing with anchors. It's, it's those sort of pull-out tests in high strength and low strength concrete, also in track and untracked concrete. And then for sure, we are doing basic shear tests. This is just monotonic uh, shear testing where we, where we check the capacity for those anchors under shear loading. We test our products and make them robust with new and worn drill bits. We need to do some crack cycling tests also for static loading because our concrete elements may develop cracks during the life, lifetime and those cracks may vary a little bit and we check the robustness of those products. And we do test, for example, for edge distance and spacing, just to avoid situations that anchors installed on a job site to create failures that we see here on, the, on that photo. And new is, or newer is the seismic qualification tests. And uh, this is what we need to do as well, if you would like to use, or if for anchors that we qualify for use under seismic conditions in Europe. And there, the 
the loading on both anchors is not anymore static or continuous increasing. So there we also test the anchors under pulsating uh, alternating load cycles and also this crack cycles up to open up to a crack width of 0.8 millimeters. And the next video just shows a little bit how does it look like a little bit more in detail, it gives you a short impression of the conditions. Tests reveal severe differences in how anchors perform when cracks open and close in concrete, as in the case of seismic events. Thanks to follow-up expansion of the anchor segments, objects installed with healthy mechanical anchors designed for seismic conditions remain securely and reliably fastened, even where significant cracking occurs. I was not sure. Could you hear the, the sound as well, or did I just hear it in my in my room? No, we could hear, but it was a little bit disturbing. Okay. Um, basically, what we have seen here is um, the, that we are testing those anchors in cracked concrete, so we can open those cracks during testing. And basically, what you have seen that the cracks are opening and closing, and this mimics basically the situation of the anchor in a seismic event, because for sure the structure needs, or in the concrete structure, those cracks may open, those cracks may close during those cycli cycles, and this is basically mimicked by those uh, tests. And uh, just showing the next slide, the typical test protocol that we are seeing here, and that diagram is showing in the flight tension node, that's the green light in that, that green line in this diagram, the black curves, that's the crack width. So you see that the crack width is cycling, it's closing and opening up to 0.8 millimeters. So that's really typical crack cycles that we have found on the, those researches that this is typical uh, for concrete structure during a seismic event. And then you see the anchor displacement at the red line uh, over this uh, 59 track cycles. And basically, the requirement is that for sure the anchor is, shall not uh, slip completely out of the hole, but also there are some requirements on the maximum displacement that the anchor under the applied load during the test um, can, can make or can have. And for sure, this this uh, test was quite successful, and uh, this placement were quite limited. Now, what does that mean? So we qualify our products and our recent uh, or our uh, product uh, for chemical anchors qualified for many applications, including seismic is RE five hundred and four. Um, and just to give you an impression, what does it mean to get this qualification done? And with that product, uh, 5,000 tests have been done in external third-party independent labs just to do all the seismic, all the qualifications, including creep, high and low temperatures, but also including seismic. So these tests, we are doing much more tests than a couple of job site tests to qualify our products. So this is all done according to those European guidelines and the result, because for sure no customer can assess all those testing, the result is basically summarized in such European um, uh, ETAs, European technical assessments. And this is just one example uh, for RE500 before, and this is always divided in four parts in a cover page where basically the product name is stated. Then there are a couple of annexes. And in the annex A, you see installation conditions or how to install those products. In the annex B, the intended use. There for sure it's written if the product or the information is given, if the product is qualified for use under static loading only, or also, also suited for applications under seismic conditions. And the last part, the Annex C, shows basically then the performance, all the product performances. And also, for example, for bonded anchor, the um, 
bone strengths that can be used under seismic conditions. And just to show you on the next slide how important it is, and this chart on the right hand side shows basically the differences between the bond strengths that the specifiers can utilize under static conditions that the gray bar in cracked concrete. And for comparison, you see the red bars for the different sizes um, for seismic conditions. And they are these crack cycles and so on. This reduces the bond capacity that's clear and you see an average, it's about 50% of the performance, or you see a drop of up to 40, 50, 60% for the design and the seismic loadings. And this is what you need to consider. So if you select a fastener product, that, is, that in case of seismic loadings, you need to test, you need to select a product that has been tested for seismic loading, and you also need to design for the capacity and for the strengths that, that is given in those um, European technical assessments. Because it's hard just to, to estimate what is the performance there. It's for sure much more reliable if you can uh, build on independent documents like the ETA. And for sure this drop, uh, so R500 is a very good product that is very much suited for applications under seismic loading. If you go to other brands or not tested products, they may behave much worse because this one is really optimized for those applications. KT does not just offer chemical anchors like R500 before uh, and qualify those anchors for seismic uh, applications, but also mechanical anchors. Uh, very common ones, HST4 and HST3, and also screw anchors, but also undercut anchors and HSL anchors. So we have a full portfolio that is qualified for seismic applications. Now coming to design after the qualified products, let's talk a little bit about design. And just looking here on such uh, steel to concrete connection, and for sure the steel part, and here in the morning or no, for you in the afternoon, one, one hour ago, we heard a lot about uh, how to design steel structures for static, but even much more for, for seismic loading. And in the Eurocode, it's, it's exactly the same. There's a steel design code, that's the Eurocode 3. There is the Eurocode 1, where basically the, the action is defined and the, the products that they are using there need to comply with the harmonized European uh, codes. So that defines the strengths of the steel elements. If we are looking to the concrete here, a foundation, for example, it's pretty much the same. There's a standard design standard, the Eurocode 2 for the concrete, and uh, you can do the design for that. But what was missing for a long time was how to connect now the steel structure with the foundation, and that's basically done in many cases with post installed fasteners or even cast in fasteners. That was not clear, but since 2018, there is now uh, Eurocode 2 part 4 that defines and regulates the design of those connections. And these connections can be designed for static as well as for seismic loading. For seismic loading on the action part, there's even a simplified method how to define what actions shall be applied. And for the resistance side, there's a, a difference because there is no harmonized EN standards to qualify fasteners. Therefore, the only way how to qualify fasteners is the ETA route. And we call that the ETA route because for those products, the EOTA can issue after testing according to those European assessment documents for specific products, ETA's European technical approvals. So the products that shall be used or that should be used for fastening and fixings, especially for seismic loading, shall have an ETA assessment, including a qualification process for seismic loading. 
that's the important thing and that's maybe the takeaway for you uh, from that from that session now what is important and just showing us a precise map seismic map here and for sure that's not the the content of the european code but the table shows here what is important to consider in case you have to fasten uh, something besides the loading and on the one hand side it's the seismicity level so there are different classes defined in the euro code from class one uh, or from very low low and more than low and uh, more than low seismicity level means that the, you have um, point a higher acceleration than 1.0.1 g and then on the other side you have important importance classes for sure uh, importance class one is more farmers building stuff like that where people cannot be hurt or injured and then you have importance class four these are hospitals and buildings like that that need to be safe and and need to work reliable this in, but also after a seismic event. And for most of those cases, uh, for fastenings, we end up with a seismic C2 qualified anchor product, and you need to design, especially those connections for these anchors that are qualified according to this category C2. Just one hint. Um, what is important and even more important for seismic applications is to fill annular gaps. And uh, if shear loads will act during a seismic event, it is important that these shear loads are transferred without any, any gap between the anchor and the base plate, because otherwise you, get, you may get some hammering effects and this will even amplify your shear loads. And that's uh, not very, or and that, that's, um, that's considered also in the Euro code with that famous alpha gap factor. Um, if you fill or if specifiers consider gap filling, the capacity in shear is 50% higher than in unfilled holes. And the next video just shows you, shows how this gap filling may look like, and here he has um, it. That's just one method that you have seen, that's a special washer where injection mortar or mortar is injected in a small hole and by this you make sure that the, the gap between the fastener and the base plate is, is fully filled and that's very beneficial for the behavior under seismic loading. And another topic that you should remember for sure, um, especially for concrete structures, uh, also, those concrete structures may be designed with plastic hinges. And uh, it's not a good idea. Plastic hinges is a good idea because this allows lots of activity for the structure, but it's not a good idea to fasten and to locate anchors in those plastic hinges. That's because uh, the crack width is extremely high, and fasteners that are located in those plastic hinges may not work properly during. In the earthquake. So, therefore, uh, it's allowed to fasten in those structures, but to avoid the position in plastic hinging areas. Yes, what matters most, or we all want to avoid that anyone gets injured by, um, by our or by components structure that are somehow fastened to concrete. So therefore, we all want to have integrity of our buildings and structures. And what is important is how can we do that? So we should apply proper design rules. In India, there is currently no, no standard, but in Europe, there is the Euro Code 2 Part 4 that regulates 
the design of faster links under static as well under seismic loading. And highly recommend by me also use the, the, the same principles and this design method uh, in India. The second one, product qualification. Just by looking to a product, someone cannot decide if this is really a good product or not. Therefore, manufacturers need to qualify their products, for example, by an European technical assessment. This is independent testing. This means an independent assessment. And if you use a product with a European technical assessment for the specific application, um, you can design in a reliable way. And last but not least, and this is also important for fasteners, installation quality. So fasteners are small and tiny products, especially if I compare to steel games and what we have heard 30 minutes ago. Um, and the best fastener can be installed, or if it's not installed, if the fastener is not installed properly, it may not work, especially not work under seismic conditions. So therefore, training for installers, installation quality is crucial to, in the end, have a reliable solution on the job site. That's my closing things. Um, thank you for your attention. I hope we learned a little bit how we qualify and our anchors, how to design anchors. And uh, that's now I'm closing now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you for this uh, a comprehensive session. I think uh, with these two sessions, we were able to address both the aspects. Number one, how to design the primarily the structures. And second, if they are connected to an existing structure, then how to also effectively transfer the load in case of earthquake uh, situations. Uh, the majority of the questions which were there in the chat box have already been answered by Rupen sir, uh, which were uh, towards his uh, topic. A few questions related to anchoring, I was able to answer. Maybe one last question, which was there, uh, I put it to Michael. Uh, Mr. Rahul is asking, what is plastic hinges? So there is one question which has been asked by him. Maybe, Michael, if you would like to answer that. Plastic hinges for reinforced concrete structures means uh, you can also uh, design this plastic hinges so you allow yielding of, your, of the cast in reverbs. And this basically allows huge deformations of concrete structures because concrete itself is very brittle, but also there, I guess, we take advantage or structural designers take advantage of the ductility of the steel. And uh, for example, you can, uh, you can design connections in reinforced concrete in a way that also the reinforcing bars are yielding. And this is what we call plastic inching of in structures. Perfect. I think, uh, I hope uh, Ra Mr. Rahul, uh, we were able to answer this question. And uh, I think there was one more question. Rupan sir has already put the answer to it. So uh, I think with this there, I do not see a lot of uh, pending questions. I, in fact, I do not see any pending questions. We have been able to address all of them there was do we get reading of this uh, recording of this session i mean the recording would be available in the website but it will take a week time so uh, you can log into the seismic academy uh, website directly and then you can get a get this recording uh, Kaushal, maybe you can just launch the uh, link of the website so that if uh, people want to get an access to it or even other content they can uh, get this So that's already uh, the link is there on your uh, screen. So you can uh, keep it as a bookmark or save it for future references. Uh, that's it. I think we have, uh, it was a pretty, uh, pretty good learning session over the last one hour. And I, I cannot just thank enough uh, Professor Rupin Goswami and uh, Michael for taking out time. I know both of uh, for Michael also, we are living in a different time zone. So. Uh, so I, I really thank both of you for taking time out. I know Sir is also uh, ha has his classes and he had to take time out within the classes to to get this uh, lecture delivered. So it's uh, my heartfelt uh, thanking to both of you.
and uh, a, a big round of uh, thanks to all the people who took out time to came to this session and uh, and uh, learn from this we look forward to your future participation as well and uh, for anything you can always reach out to us uh, directly through the website or through the emails which has been provided so uh, with this i would like to call, uh, end the session i thank everyone for your participation there is a feedback uh, which is uh, which is there on your screen maybe you can rate us the session and also from there we can also take some learning and bring more relevant topics in the future sessions so with this i wish everyone a happy weekend and uh, see you, thank you in the next session thank you, thank you so much sir thank yeah you. thank you so much sir thank you michael thank you kaushal for being the support and thank you everyone thank you all the best